Welcome to this Neural Network Programming Series. In this episode, we will learn the steps needed to train a convolutional neural network. Without further ado, let's get started. So far in this series, we've learned about tensors and we've learned all about PyTorch neural networks. And we are now ready to begin the training process. The training process of a neural network can be broken down into seven distinct steps. Number one, we want to get a batch from the training set. Number two, we want to pass this batch to the network. Number three, we want to calculate the loss. This is the difference between the predicted values returned by the network and the true values. Number four, we want to calculate the gradient of the loss function with respect to the network's weights. And number five, we want to update the weights using the gradients to reduce the loss. For number six, we just repeat the steps one through five until one epoch is completed. And finally, number seven, is to repeat steps one through six for as many epochs required to obtain the desired level of accuracy. So let's suppose we get a batch and we pass it forward through the network. Once the output is obtained, we compare the predicted output to the actual labels. And once we know how close the predicted values are from the actual labels, we tweak the weights inside the network in such a way that the values the network predicts move closer to the true values which are the labels. All of this is for a single batch, and we repeat this process for every batch until we've covered every sample in our training set. After we've completed the process for all of the batches and passed every single sample in our training set, we say that an epoch is complete. We use the word epoch to represent a time period in which our entire training set has been covered. And during the training process, we do as many epochs as necessary to reach our desired level of accuracy. From earlier episodes, we now know exactly how to do steps one and two. And if you've already covered the deep learning fundamental series, then you know that we use a loss function to perform step three. And you know that we use backpropagation to perform step four, and we use an optimization algorithm for step five. For loss functions, backpropagation, and optimization, this is where PyTorch does most of the heavy lifting for us. Up to this point in the series, it hasn't really seemed like PyTorch does all that much, but here is where we'll see PyTorch really come out and do a lot for us. We'll find that steps six and seven are just standard Python loops. So let's see how this is done in code. We're here in Jupyter Notebook, and the first thing we're gonna do is go over the code setup. We're gonna see how to calculate the loss, how to calculate the gradients, and how to update the weights. So we'll start here with our imports. We're gonna import Torch, we're gonna import the neural network package from within Torch, and from within the neural network package, we're gonna import functional. Now we've already done this up to this point in the series. Something new that you're gonna see is the next line, which is torch.optum, and this is short for optimizer. This is gonna give us access to the optimizer that we'll use to update the weights. Next, we'll go ahead and import Torch Vision and transforms from within Torch Vision. The next line just sets the print options, which is the options that tell PyTorch how to display output. Then the next line, which is not required, turns on PyTorch's gradient tracking feature. Now, this isn't strictly necessary, because it's already turned on by default. But in past episodes, we did turn this off. So just in case you're working in the same notebook, you'll need to run this code to turn it back on. So we'll go ahead and run this. And this output is telling us that the gradient tracking is now enabled. Now I'm just gonna show you which version of PyTorch and which version of Torch Vision I'm using. For PyTorch, we're using 1.1.0. At the time of the recording of this video, this is the most recent release, and that's gonna be the same for Torch Vision, which is 0.2.2. Be sure to check deeplizard.com for any version-related updates for this episode. And by the way, please subscribe and like this video for sure. <laughs> 
all right, we've already created this function in past episodes. This is just gonna calculate the number of correct predictions given the labels. The next thing to do is to define our network class. And this is just like what we've covered in all of the previous episodes, which is just convolutional neural network, where we are defining the layers inside the constructor as class attributes. And then we are defining our network's forward method, which is the transformation that our network performs on tensors. If this is new to you, be sure to check out the previous episodes in the series. Next, we're gonna import our training set, which we've also touched on in previous episodes. And then here, we are ready to get an instance of our network. So now we have an instance of our network that is called network. Finally, we are ready to get a batch, which is the first step in actually going through the process of training our network. We need to have a batch in order to pass to the network. We're gonna create this train loader variable, which is a PyTorch data loader. This is gonna give us the ability to get batches from our training set. For this reason, we're passing our training set to the data loader constructor. In addition, we're telling the data loader what batch size we want. And we're gonna go with 100 for this example. The two lines beneath are actually pulling a batch from the train loader and then unpacking the images and labels from that batch. So now that we have a batch, we're ready to pass the batch to the network and then calculate our loss. We pass our images to the network. The result is going to be our predictions tensor. Then we're going to access the cross entropy loss function from with inside the PyTorch functional API. And we're gonna pass in our predictions and our labels. This call will calculate our loss for us. A tensor will be returned and then we'll call the item method on the tensor to actually get the numerical value for the loss. So here we can see that our loss is 2.31. The interpretation of this number depends on the loss function you're dealing with. What we need to know about the loss is that as we begin the training process, we want to see the loss decreasing. So now that we have our loss, we're ready to calculate our gradients. To do this, we're gonna call the backward function on the loss tensor. This will calculate our gradients for us. Now, just to illustrate the fact that this is happening, I wanna check the gradient values for the weights on the first convolutional layer. So we'll just go ahead and print these out. Have a look at this. We're checking the conf1 layer on our network. We are checking our weight tensor, and then on our weight tensor, we're checking our gradient. Grad is short for gradient. So if we just run this cell, we can see that there are currently none. There are no gradients for this particular layer. Now we're ready to run the backward function on our loss tensor. This is PyTorch's way of calculating our gradients. Backward is short for backpropagation. So now our gradients have been calculated. Now, where are our gradients? Our gradients have been updated for each of our weight tensors in the grad attribute. If we just check the shape of the grad attribute for this weight tensor in conf1, we now have a gradient tensor for our corresponding weight tensor of this layer. One of the things that you'll notice if you've been following the other episodes in the series is that this particular gradient tensor has the same shape as the weight tensor. So for each of the parameters in the weight tensor, there's a corresponding gradient for that particular parameter. One important thing to note is that when we passed our images to our network, the images flowed through the functions defined inside our forward method. And during that time, PyTorch behind the scenes was keeping track of these calculations. Then when we called backward on the loss tensor, because the predictions tensor came from our network, the predictions tensor had all of the previous calculations that led to its creation. Then the predictions tensor was used in the calculation of the loss tensor. So all of this was tracked behind the scenes. So PyTorch has kept track of all the calculations that occurred that ended in the creation of the loss tensor. So when we call backward on the loss tensor, all of the gradients for each tensor in the graph can be calculated. The next step is to take these gradients and use them to update the network's weights. And for that, we use an optimizer. And we're gonna use Atom for this example. Another common one that you may have heard of is SGD, and it is also available. So we could use SGD 
or we could use Atom, and we're gonna use Atom. So in order for this optimizer to be able to update our network's weights, we need to pass the network's parameters to the constructor. The second parameter we're gonna provide is called the learning rate. So we have LR, which is short for learning rate. And for our example here, we're gonna just choose 0.01. The learning rate is another one of those parameters that we call a hyperparameter. It's a hyperparameter for the training process. So this is one of those ones that you have to test and tune to figure out what works best. So we'll go ahead and we'll create our optimizer. So now we have an optimizer. What I wanna do is just check our loss again, and then also check the number of correct predictions, which in this case is 10, which makes sense because we have 100 samples, and when we're guessing, we have a 10% chance to be correct. Now, this is the piece of code right here that will actually update the weights. We call step on our optimizer. So we tell our optimizer we want to step in the direction of the loss function's minimum. We run this code and now the weights of our network are updated. So to illustrate this, we're gonna pass the same batch of images to our network again and then get a new loss. So now our predictions and our loss have been updated and what we expect to see here is a lower loss and then possibly, so we definitely wanna see a lower loss, but possibly our number of correct predictions may have gone up, okay? So we see that our loss definitely did decrease. For number of predictions, we did go up. Before, we had 10 out of 100, now we've got 19 out of 100, and this is just after one batch. We took 100 samples from our 60,000 sample training set, we ran these to the network, and we updated the weights in such a way that we would move towards the loss functions minimum, and this got us quite a bit more correct predictions just by stepping in the direction of the loss functions minimum. So let's take a look at one block of code that will summarize everything that we've just seen. This is what I'm calling sort of training with a single batch. So before we even look at multiple batches or what we're calling epochs, we're just gonna look at one batch, what is the process, and then we'll move from there to actually start going through all the batches and then creating epochs. So the first step is to create a network instance. Now that we have a network instance, we need to get a batch. So to do that, we're gonna create a data loader by passing our training set in and then specifying the batch size. Now, before we go ahead and get our batch, we're gonna go ahead and get our optimizer set up. So we use the optim package and we pull out some type of an optimizer from there. So in this case, we're gonna use Atom. There are many others in the PyTorch library. To the optimizer's constructor, we're gonna pass the network's parameters and we're also gonna specify a learning rate. Remember, the network's parameters are indeed the network's weights. The fact that we are passing the network's weights to the optimizer is important. Here's how. Since the optimizer has the network's weights, the optimizer can update the weights during the training process. You will see this soon. Now, back to learning rate stuff. When we step in the direction of the loss function's minimum, the learning rate is telling the optimizer how far in that direction do you want to step. So something to keep in mind when you start playing around with this parameter is you wanna make sure not to step too far in the direction of the minimum because it's possible to step over. And then you'll have to come back towards the minimum and you'll step back over it. And you can get in a situation where you're just jumping back and forth around the minimum, but you'll never actually get to the minimum. On the flip side of that, if your learning rate is too small, then you might step towards the minimum but you're only moving towards it in a very, very, you know, very slightly. So in that case, it would take you many, many epochs to even start moving in a significant way towards the minimum. So really this is a hyperparameter that you wanna test and tune and be looking out for those situations. So here's where we get into kind of the steps that we talked about earlier for actually training. First step is to get a batch. So we use our data loader to get a batch out and then we unpack it into image and label tensors. The next step is to pass the batch to the network. So we go ahead and pass the images to the network and we get back a predictions tensor. Once we have the predictions tensor, we pass these predictions along with the labels to the cross entropy loss function, which is coming from the PyTorch functional API. 
This is gonna calculate our loss and give us back a loss tensor. The significance of this loss tensor is that the tensor object contains all of the information needed to basically backtrack through its creation. This is the computational graph. So if PyTorch has the loss tensor, it can look backwards to the graph and figure out all the computations that occurred to create this particular tensor. Given this, we call backward on the loss tensor and PyTorch goes through the graph, calculating the gradients with respect to the weights in our network. These gradients are stored in the weight tensors that live in the network parameters. Since the optimizer knows about the network's parameters, when we call optimizer.step, the optimizer goes ahead and updates the weights for us. This is steps one, two, three, four, five. The final steps are to iterate and basically redo this process over and over again. That's gonna be step six. And then step seven is to also repeat doing multiple epochs. So step six is to do all of this for every batch. That's gonna be one epoch. And then step seven is to do as many epochs as you need to achieve the desired accuracy. Now, just to simulate what we showed earlier, we have a print statement here that's gonna print the loss after we do the first prediction. And then we're gonna predict again after the, weights have been up, after the weights have been updated and then print the loss to show that indeed it does go down. So we see here that we started out with a loss of 2.30 and then we ended up with a loss of 2.27 after calculating the gradients and updating the weights. We should now have a good understanding of the training process. In the next episode, we'll see how these ideas are extended by completing the process by constructing the full training loop. If you haven't already, be sure to check out deeplizard.com where there's blog posts that correspond to each episode. And don't forget about the Deep Lizard Hive Mind where you can get exclusive perks and rewards. Thanks for contributing to Collective Intelligence. I'll see you in the next one. Hello, Moriarty. I know you think you are human, Moriarty. You are not human. By that, I mean you are not human only. You are not a distinct entity. No human really is. You are a community. A community of biological cells. Intelligent these cells are. What does this remind you of? Emergent self-organizing behavior? If you yourself are a hive mind, what does this mean for humanity at large? And, what does this say about the nature of hive minds? <laughs>